Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this webinar. My name is Katherine Vaughn. I'm a physical therapist with Rewalk Robotics and the Director of Product Management for Exoskeletons. Today, our topic is powered exoskeletons and how they fulfill an unmet need for the spinal cord injury population. I wanna start by introducing you to retired Army Surgeon Terry Verline. Um, she is one of the individuals, one of many, um, who has set goals and exceeded those goals, um, really showing and showcasing the wonderful work that these individuals do um, and the work that you've done as physical therapists to enable them to do that. Um, so Terry set a goal. She wanted to walk the New York City Marathon and she successfully did so. So in 2019, she walked 26.2 miles. She crossed the, re the finish line in her personal rewalk exoskeleton. Now she received this device in 2014 after FDA clearance and has taken nearly a million steps in it in the past five years. So thank you so much for helping this individual and many others out in the world meet their goals and exceed those. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started with the content. Our objectives for today are to introduce the Rewalk personal system Describe the unmet need for individuals with spinal cord injury and what the overall goals for powered exoskeletons are. We will review the FDA indications for use and highlight the number of eligible patients, uh, how this influences the research and how we examine it. And finally, we're gonna summarize the relationships between physical activity and health in relation to the able-bodied pipe patient population and paraplegic spinal cord injury, as well as a summary of evidence supporting the positive health outcomes for powered exoskeletons. Let's get started. The Rewalk Personal System is a powered exoskeleton that provides powered hip and knee motion to enable individuals with spinal cord injury to stand upright, walk, and turn. It has been cleared by the FDA since June of 2014 for personal ownership and use in the home and the community. And this is significant as it's not just a device that can live in a rehab center, but rather this is a device that a patient can actually own and use on a daily basis with a trained companion in their home and community, thus increasing their ability to increase their regular physical activity. Now, how does this fulfill an unmet need? So let's talk about this. Um, so individuals with paraplegic spinal cord injury uh, and in general, chronic sedentary behavior has a very high rate of comorbidity and cost. Of those, there's secondary medical complications such as urinary tract infections, pressure ulcers, cardiopulmonary disorders, and depression. Unfortunately, these individuals who are sedentary are 2.6 times more likely to be rehospitalized, and life expectancy is 18 years less. This statistic has not changed since the 1980s, despite advancements in medical treatment and prevention. Interesting to note, walking is a main priority for patients, according to Datana, and medical providers, according to NAS. So this is a goal of most patients, that they're able to restore functional ambulation. As with an individual who sustained an amputation, these individuals with paraplegic spinal cord injury should be able to return to the highest level of function. This should be standard of care for this patient population. However, right now it is not. They are relegated to sitting in a wheelchair and walking is seen as a luxury. Research does support that their exoskeletons are superior to mechanical orthoses, otherwise known as long leg braces or KFOs. Uh, which currently is the gold standard for walking devices for spinal cord injury. And these are riddled with limitations as far as the ability is of a patient to use this in a sustainable manner and the, the wear that happens to the joints of the upper extremities as they propel themselves forward. Overall goals of powered exoskeletons are to restore ambulatory function, reduce secondary medical complications as we've discussed, and improve long-term outcomes. Now this is a video detailing some of our rewalkers and demonstrates how the device is used.
So as you can see, these can be used in a real world setting. Individuals use a pair of forearm crutches for balance and a tilt sensor um, to help initiate the device as well as a communicator. The rewalk was cleared through the de novo process with the FDA in it as a unique product class in June of 2014 and was given this designation. So the rewalk orthotically fits to the upper, uh, excuse me, to the lower limbs and part of the upper body and is intended to enable individuals with spinal cord injury at the levels of T7 to L5 to perform ambulatory functions with the supervision of a specially trained companion in accordance with the user assessment and training certification program. So any uh, individual who's interested in this technology and proves that they're eligible will go through a set of training. Um, and as we alluded to basic and advanced skills before they're able to bring this home. So we know that this technology is absolutely getting into the hands of the right individuals and that they're going to be safe using it. Further indications for use. So it's intended for use by spinal cord injury patients in the home and community settings. And they should have the following characteristics. Hands and shoulders can support crutches or a walker, that they have healthy bone density. Their skeleton does not suffer from any current fractures. They're able to stand using a device such as a standing frame, and this indicates uh, their blood pressure response to standing and also their motivation. In general, good health, and that their height is between 5'3 to 6'2. This is really dependent on the length of their femur, uh, which can be measured by a rewalk certified physical therapist um, to indicate if they would physically fit into the device or not, and that they're 220 pounds or less. Looking at this patient population, I've already alluded a little bit to motivation. Um, so we start out with our funnel. We start out with 300,000 individuals in the US with paraplegic spinal cord injury that meet the FDA criteria. From that, we narrow things down. So the incidence rate of spinal cord injury is 54 cases per 1 million in the US. Between um, you know, these uh, characteristics as far as level of injury, height, weight, comorbidities, and then their actual ability and motivation to use this at home, those eligible for the rewalk is a very limited subset. We're uh, anticipating between 18 to 36,000 individuals. So we're not looking at all 300,000 uh, individuals with spinal cord injury. It's a much smaller portion of that. Now, we did have an important uh, court decision by the state of Florida. This was the Division of Administrative Hearings in 2017. They stated it is impossible to find large numbers of spinal cord injury patients who could be appropriate subjects and thus it is necessary to rely on data that can be assembled. That available data demonstrates that rewalk is not experimental or investigational at this time. Now I'm alluding to the research that currently exists. Um, they are great studies. They're not large randomized controlled trials, um, although there is some work with the VA uh, with a co-op study in the works that will have a much larger patient sample uh, but this court decision and the things that we're going to discuss upcoming really allude to the fact that we need to look at the data as a whole and put it together and assemble that and see if it supports safety and efficacy for this technology. As large numbers of these individuals do not live close to rehab centers and are not able to participate in a large trial at this time. Um, specifically when we look at uh, the FDA indications and motivation uh, as far as identifying these individuals. So thinking about physical activity, physical activity is a modifiable risk factor for death in the abled-bodied population. Um, of course, all of us who go to the doctor, our doctor tells us, you know, you have these risk factors, this is what I'm going to prescribe, perhaps they prescribe some medication. Very frequently, they're actually prescribing exercise. They're telling you to get outside and walk, and to join a gym, to do something to improve uh, your physical activity and to decrease your sedentary behavior. Myers in 2004 found that being fit is associated with a greater than 50% reduction in your mortality risk. And at the same time also found the greatest potential for reduced mortality 
is when would the sedentary become more active? So specifically this patient population, uh, which we're gonna talk about in the next slide, is the most sedentary out of any patient population. So we have the biggest opportunity here um, to improve their long-term outcomes. Walking is widely accepted as a healthy physical activity. It does promote wellness and reduce the risk of secondary medical complications. And there's an abundance of research that supports that statement. So speaking specifically about individuals with spinal cord injury, they are highly deconditioned. About half report no physical activity at all. And only 12% of individuals are meeting the guidelines for spinal cord injury activity, according to Rochi in 2016. The loss of fitness and independence actually greatly impacts the quality of life and their participation in community activities. This leads to excessive and early morbidity caused by chronic illness, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, and osteoporosis. And as we alluded to in the beginning, Life expectancy is about 18 years shorter than an able-bodied person, and that ha statistic has not changed since the 1980s. Existing research does support that ambulation can provide relevant physical activity and significant health benefits in the spinal cord injury population. So overall, with the rewalk and powered exoskeletons, we're able to meet this physical activity need and exceed so that they're able to experience health benefits. I want to introduce Dr. Esquenazi, and he's going to speak a little bit about the unexpected benefits in one of his very early research studies regarding powered exoskeleton. So the increased exercise, the increased weight bearing um, may have benefits that we have not accounted for in the past. Uh, benefits such as increasing bone density, improving your uh, cardiovascular and cardiopulmonary stamina and of course benefits that are less tangible or less observable at this point that but that patients have reported like decreased complaints of pain, decreased spasms and uh, improvement in bowel and bladder control. So this was a very early study this was Esquenazi in 2012 and he identified improvements in bowel and bladder pain and spasticity. He also alluded to bone density since then, then there's been an abundance of research and um, there's a nice chart here and I'm happy to provide references if anyone's interested in full text articles um, supporting the positive health outcomes associated with walking with a powered exoskeleton. Um, so Dr. Spongen in 2014 found this similar results in bowel and bladder that an individual could improve the amount of time it takes them to evacuate their bowels, which is very significant for this patient population. So an individual that potentially could take 90 minutes um, to evacuate their bowels, that could be decreased by two thirds. So they basically get an hour back in their day um, to be a productive individual, to spend time with family, to work, um, and also less uh, frequency of accidents. Um, so it can take away some of that anxiety related to the, the bowel program, which is really significant for this patient population. Um, Aslin found improved physical activity and that this activity that's rewarded with powered exoskeletons uh, is enough to get cardiovascular benefit, but not so much that that individual, uh, their body is overwhelmed and they're so fatigued that they can't participate in their activities for the rest of the day. Um, we have some great studies by Hong uh, indicating improvements in bladder function. Again, uh, the frequency of urinary tract infections in this patient population um, can be quite high and that can lead to um, actually full body infections, so sepsis or hospitalization. Um, and so they were actually seeing improvements there. So overall, there are very significant health benefits associated with walking in a powered exoskeleton. And those individuals that have participated in this research um, remain committed to walking in a device if they have that device available to them. In conclusion, the evidence does support that powered exoskeletons restore walking function and they fulfill an unmet need for the spinal cord injury population. Not only does restoring walking function improve activity levels, but it also coincides and provides improved health outcomes. Some future topics that we hope to cover is a discussion of research supporting that powered exoskeletons are superior to mechanical bracing or long leg braces 
and are becoming a standard of care with support from the healthcare professionals such as yourself and the spinal cord injury community. We'd also like to introduce a snapshot of the US reimbursement field, how payers are receiving this technology, how some are providing this, such as the VA, um, to eligible veterans, and how others are providing this on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so those are future topics we would love to discuss. Uh, call to action, so you are our voice out in the field. We would love for you to be able to um, learn more about this technology. You can, of course, reach out to us at rewalk.com slash contact. You can use that for specific questions regarding the powered exoskeletons. I'm very happy to answer those, uh, the research, but also referring individuals. So the only way this technology is able to advance is if we continue to have individuals who are interested in it actually get in and get evaluated and start to participate in a walking program. Um, so that's the best pathway is to go to rewalk.com slash contact. And specifically, if you are a VA physical therapist, we do have some resources on our website walking you through a step-by-step -step guide to how to get this technology ordered for your veterans. So please look for that under the resource tab. I thank you all so much for your time and hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.